undefeated champion. Nortino Bali takes on future Hall of Famer. One of the most polished stars in all of boxing. Nonito Donaire. Ready, set, go. He remains at the top of his game. Undefeated versus legend. Obali versus Donaire for the Bantamweight World title only on Showtime. It's now the postseason, and every day of these NBA playoffs, DraftKings will have $10,000 of prizes up for grabs. You got a chance at 10,000 in total prizes. And it's free to enter. DraftKings will be offering two free to play pools every day of the NBA playoffs. Just download the DraftKings app and go to pools and choose from a wide variety of free contests for an opportunity to win cash prizes. All you have to do is answer a handful of questions around what you think is going to happen during the day's basketball games and track your results throughout the evening. Questions will range from which team will hit the most threes to which team will score first. DraftKings is safe, secure, and reliable, so you can deposit and withdraw your money at your convenience. Download the top-rated DraftKings app now and use the promo code SMOKE when signing up to get your free shot of $10,000 in total prizes every day of the basketball playoffs. Head to DraftKings Pools page to get your shot at huge cash prizes. And make sure you use promo code SMOKE for a limited time, only at DraftKings. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for full details. Welcome back to another edition of All the Smoke. My brother. Jack, was a very festive today. Yes, what man. Are these, what are these called? I don't want them. Thobes. Th Thobes? Yep. Thobes by King's Cloth in Dubai. And then you got the matching... You hit him. J yeah, JC. I'm saying you're making it harder for your, for your other brothers out here. Hey, though. man, one thing about it, man. not everybody could do it like you You do. look good, you feel good, you pray good. Okay. Shout out I to like all my that. Muslims out there. Who's that person with the Puff Daddy ringer? <laughs> <laughs> all about the Benjamins. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, man, welcome to the show. Perfect intro. Isaiah Thomas. Appreciate Little you, bro. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you for What's your up? time, man. Appreciate it. Thank you for being here, bro. On for a minute. I've been hitting him like, he's man. Just like, I, I want, I'm going to come, I'm going to come. So... Man, we finally got you here. We appreciate that. Seattle boy. Yes, sir. You know, no. 2020 obviously was was tough for a lot of us. Uh, you know, lost Kobe, the pandemic, uh, the George Floyd incident. Um, seeing how tough that was, what are you motivated by? Um, you know, as we go, you know, almost halfway through 2021. I think I'm motivated by just change. You know, I think the positive out of all those things that's happened is everybody, you know, trying to change for the better. Mm -hmm no matter the race, no matter the culture. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're looking forward to, you know, what's what's next and what can everybody change to make this world, mm -hmm. you know, a better place. And I think overall, you know, we could kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel, you know, in terms of things getting back to normal. Mm -hmm. But I think we just got to keep, you know, keep our foot on the gas to make positive change because, you know, the world is not in a great place right mm -hmm. now. And I think you know, we can make it all better. So much more work to do. For sure, mm -hmm. for sure. Where do you feel you are as far as health? Obviously, we'll talk about the injury a little later and what exactly happened to you, but where are you right now as far as health, you feel? Health, I'm good now. You know, it's been a long little three years since I, you know, first got injured, but mm -hmm. I'm 100% healthy now. Mm -hmm. um, I had a surgery, not to get too deep into it, but I had surgery last May. Mm-hmm which, you know, fixed my ultimate problem. So what did they have to go in and do? We can go and explain this. So I, think I, I had a know. resurface of my hip. So my, my hip is metal now. Mm, so I got, wow. it's, I'm the first one in professional sports, well, basketball to play with a metal hip. Mm. And so it's just it, half your hip, that socket? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, my, it's my joint. Okay. So what my initial problem was, my hip was bone on bone. So, mm. you know, it's bone no on bone, I have no range of motion. So I was really fighting every day just to, you know, stay above water until I fixed my hip. So I got a resurface of my hip joint. It gives me the normal amount of space that everybody got in a regular joint. My shit just metal. Mm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you go through the airport, you got to go through the little... The special one. Yeah, yeah, you got to go through oh, that. Shit, that's, but, that ain't nothing but my hip. Yeah, yeah, but <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, that it changed my life because mm. I was in pain every day. Right. Yeah. Not just trying to hoop playing with my kids, life. in the house, life. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was in pain, so it gave me my range of motion back. So health-wise, I'm good. Mentally, I'm in a great place, and, you know, just waiting for an opportunity. That's it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How challenging has it been to remain patient, knowing you're back to 100%, knowing what you can do, 
just like we know what you can do, you know what I mean? And, and we, I've been in that situation too. I'm not even being in the NBA, but knowing that I still had time, you know, had game love, but you on a different page. You know, you, you, you did some stuff that I wouldn't even think close to doing in my career. But knowing the player you are, bro, how does it feel to be patient knowing that you deserve to be back out there? I'm human at the end of the day, so yeah. that shit be hurting. Yeah. Mm, you know, that, right. that and I'ma just keep it all the way hundred. It be hurting, but you know, I got kids at home. Right. They they watch me closely and there's no quitting me. You gotta stay there, strong. There, there, there's no quit. Obviously I got my days where, you know, some days are tougher than others. I'm watching guys sign that I feel like I'm better than, mm -hmm. but you know, it, it's it's not always about, you know, the next man. Mm -hmm. I, I try to worry about, you know, what I can control. Right. And the only thing I control is being prepared. You know, when my name called, being able to take advantage of the opportunity. And if I just soak and be at the house and be hot at the situation, when my name is called, I won't be ready to take advantage of that. Right. So, you know, overall, I'm in a good place mentally, but yeah, I'm human. That should be hurting. Yeah, that should be hurting. I'll be having my days where I'd be like, damn, like how, how I go from being top five and MVP voting to years later, you know, I'm trying to find a team to play on. Right. It just makes no sense. But, know. you know, that's the business of the game. You know, that just is what it is. I just know if my name is called again and when it is called, I'll be ready to take it to the top. Mm -hmm. I, I, I promise you that. I'm healthy now, and I don't have to fight that battle of, you know, showing the world I'm healthy. Right. Are you able to still watch games and follow games, or is it? I mean, this year has been a little different for me because I'm, I'm a hoop head. Like, mm -hmm. I love hoop. Right. I've always loved it. I've always watched every most games every night. This year has just been a little different, I, I think just because obviously I watch hoop, but not as much as I did. The game is changing, so it, it's, mm. it's kind of it's kind of tough to watch, mm -hmm. you know, how the game is being played. But, you know, that's my ultimate goal to get back in the league, obviously. And I'm going to stay connected at all times, but I don't watch actual games as much as I did. I don't. Yeah, yeah. You got a prediction on who you think is coming out of East or West? Any teams you think are clear-cut? Honestly, I don't think nobody can beat Brooklyn in, you know, four times. Right. You know, on paper, that is. Right. Obviously, we, we haven't really seen them go through any adversity altogether. So mm -hmm. I think that's the the biggest question mark. But out of the East, I mean, I'm going to go with Brooklyn. And then, I mean, you can't really count LeBron out until he's, mm -hmm. he's down and All out. All the way. So, yeah, yeah. So that's what we've always it got to go through L.A. and the West. But it, it, it will be tougher than boys. It mm -hmm. will be. Great. How do you feel about the elite guard play that we continue to witness? Oh, it's amazing. I mean, them, them, them <laughs> guards, what you got? Lillard, you got... Kai. Kyrie, James Harden. Yeah. Steph has turned it up the last two months. Russ. Um, Westbrook's a cheat code. <laughs> I mean, you know, them like them top 10 point guards, it's like any given night they can, you know, mm -hmm. they can give you 50. Mm -hmm. So that's the scary part about it. But um, You fall right in that category. It's dope to watch that, though, because mm -hmm. you know the game is is about that guard position. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the wings and KD and, and LeBron and the list goes on in that, but, you know, the, the, the guards are carrying the league right now. Yeah. And it's, I think it's, got, it's at a good space right now with that because, I mean, I'm a scoring guard, and you got, you got to be a scoring guard to be effective mm -hmm. right? in, I, in today's game. So you're, what, how, how far removed from your Boston year, four, four years since you were in Boston? For 2017. So it's kind of yeah. crazy to think how much it's changed from a standpoint of how many more shots point guards are taking now. Oh, no. And the you, whole... take, you take 15 threes, and that's cool. Yeah, and it's fine. Yeah, like, that's they're, fine. They're, they're, that's they're just three pointers. That's yeah, not total pushy shots. To shoot right. that. So, I, it's crazy. We be having talks about that. Me and my home, Jamal Crawford, which you guys know. Shout out, fam. We need you on uh, the show, fam. Shout out yeah, Showtime. Yeah, we, we showtime. Need we need you on there. Um, just how in four years the game changed. That's what I was saying. Since yeah, you like it's, yeah, like even when I was playing, you know, at my peak at that year. The the scores were still ninety eight to hundred maybe. Mm -hmm. Now you see regulation is one forty five to one forty. It's a lot of shot attempts. You know the the numbers are magnified now, obviously because mm -hmm. with the, the way the game is played. Yep. But I mean, you still got to go out there and produce. So you know them 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 guards is doing that at a high level are doing an amazing job night in and night out. So the guys you had just mentioned, you know, some of the elite guards, you had good battles against all of them, in particular Steph, Westbrook, and CP3. Tell us about some of the battles you had with those three. Man, Steph, it started early with Steph just because, you know, that sack and Golden State little mm -hmm. connection. My first three years, you know, they wasn't, you know, who they obviously were for like six, seven straight years. But 
we had them battles. And, you know, going against Steph, you got to be locked in, mm -hmm. you know, from once he get the ball inbounds because he's, <laughs> right. he's, he's that special. Mm -hmm. Westbrook, Westbrook is probably always my toughest cover because, you know, obviously he's way bigger than me, but he's on go from, mm -hmm. from the tip off to, to, you know, the buzzer sounds. And then CP3 is just OG. He's, he's, he's been someone I've always looked up to, you know, since I was in, shoot, since he got in the league when I was in high school and even, you know, a, little, a, a few years before that. So he's always tough in a different way because he, obviously he's the best leader out there. Mm -hmm. um, he'll do whatever it takes to win. Crafty. He, he's the one where you hate <laughs> playing against him, but when, you, when you're on his team, you love it. Yeah, right. he's, he's, he's that competitive and, mm -hmm. and he'll do whatever it takes. But, you know, other than them three guards, like, obviously I battle with them, but... Like I said, the the guard list is is heavy. It's yeah. every night. Like you got, when I first got in the league ten years ago, it was like it was probably six, seven of them where you really had to get your sleep before the night. You know, mm -hmm. before before that game. Now it's like almost every night. Every night. Every night where you can't you can't be like, oh, that's gonna be an easy one. You mm -hmm. know, so it's it's, mm -hmm. it's competitive out there for them yeah. guards. You just said it. He's a cheat code. How do you feel? Um, your thoughts on Russ breaking the Oscar record? It's crazy because if you go back on all them interviews with, you know, the top Magic Johnson, everybody who talked about, It'll you know, that record would never be broken. Mm -hmm. It's like, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's all you got to, you know, that's all you got to explain. Like, mm -hmm. he really broke a record that nobody thought. It was like a John Stockton record. Right. Yeah, obviously, mm -hmm. that's probably never going to be broken here. Right. But that Triple W, and it happened within five years, mm -hmm. really, like where he really turned up. So... You know, Westbrook is a different animal, and I think that's why he doesn't always get the credit he deserves because, mm -hmm. you know, he don't, he shoots it straight at you. Yeah. And, you know, everybody don't like, everybody don't like that. And, but he deserves everything and more. He's one of the best point guards that ever mm -hmm. played a game. By far. Ever. Absolutely. You actually have the record for the shortest point guard to record a triple-double, triple -double, <laughs> right? So tell us about that night. Man, we was, you was, going, you was going. You was going I, get boards, and they was falling to you, stealing them. <laughs> them. I don't know. Nah, nah, they was coming. They was just, they was just dropping in my lap. Because that's one thing in my whole career. Like ever since I was a little boy, I'm like, I'm probably never gonna get that. Like you know, a triple double. Mm -hmm. So I remember we was playing the Wizards in sack. It was my third year, and hey, I might have had like 12 boards that game. I don't know how, but I I, I got it. And after the game, they gave me the ball, and they were like, you're the shortest person in NBA history to get. And I was like, well, shit, at least I, 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 got, I got, got something it. for yeah. it. You know? so, <laughs> I can go. I don't think anybody shorter than me is going to, you know, get a triple-double. Mm, yeah, so, it, it's, it's hard for the sticks. They right. got to get yeah, 10 nah, rebounds. That's tough. That's, yeah. why I, that's why I give all respect to, to Westbrook, whether he's chasing rebounds or not. Like, yeah. you got to go but out there and do it. He makes it look so easy. That's why I don't think people appreciate yeah, it no they more. Because you'll look up real quick and, like, Damn, he's got nine they in don't. the first quarter. They, they don't. And they just don't appreciate because he know. makes it look like it's not that much. Exactly. It's hard to exactly. do. Um, speaking of short guards, obviously the evolution, you were one of the smaller players, but you handed yourself, um, you know, Nate Archibald, the other Isaiah Thomas, uh, Damon Stoudemire, Allen Iverson. Who are some of the guys you looked up to knowing that you weren't going to be a 6'8 type Magic Johnson point guard? Um, obviously, my namesake, Isaiah Thomas, was, mm -hmm. you know, a big one, um, you know, watching his old tapes. But... Damon Stoudemire was somebody I modeled my whole game after. Um, he's somebody from the Pacific Northwest, mm -hmm. lefty, Shout out stayed in the Pac-10. Mm -hmm. Like somebody that, you know, realistically, I felt like I could be like. Obviously, Kobe was, you know, my favorite player ever. But then you also had Terrell Brandon from the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. It was big. Um, Muggsy Bogues, Nate Robinson, you know, all the small guys that paved the way for me. But Allen Iverson and Damon Stoudemire were two that, you know, I felt like somehow, some way, I can somewhat be them. And, you know, Damon was a little more realistic. But then when I, you know, start, you know, started to to cook them boys, <laughs> I'm like, okay, I, maybe I can be Allen Iverson, you yeah, know? So, yeah. and then when I got the stamp from him, it was like, Dope. nobody can tell me nothing after he, you know, after he stamped me. And, mm -hmm. but those are the small guards that, you know, I looked up to. Obviously, everybody before me that made it and was small, they paved the way for me. I appreciate it, but those number of guys really helped me throughout my whole career, whether it be when I was in college you know, or throughout my NBA career, and I can't thank them enough. That's what's up. Tell us about your upbringing, and when did you find sports, in particular basketball? So I'm from Tacoma, Washington, um, about 40 minutes south of Seattle. 
Uh, my parents always said I had a ball in my hands since I was a little boy. So um, basketball was the first thing I, you know, I fell in love with. You know, what I knew what love was was basketball, like real talk. What and age? I remember third grade. He was right. Third grade, my dad took me to my first Sonics game, Sonics versus Lakers. Um, actually, Sonics versus Timberwolves, Stephon Marbury Ooh. in 1997, and KG. Mm -hmm. And I wore a Laker warm-up, because my dad's from Inglewood, so I was brainwashed into being a Laker fan. <laughs> so I wore a whole Laker, the little purple breakaway pants, the oh, yellow yeah, tie. I couldn't tell you shit. Oh, you had the tear away? On, on a Timberwolves Sonics game. Like, it didn't make no <laughs> sense, but basketball since that day, since I was able to, you know, be in the tunnel, slap NBA players' hands, like mm. that changed my life. Mm. I felt like that's what I wanted to be since that day. Mm -hmm. And you know, to fast forward to now, you know, when I'm playing the NBA games and you see that fan with his hand out, I make oh, sure I always it. slap those, right. cause right. that's like- that's what's up. You used to be him. I used to be him. Right. And that's what made my dream, like that's what made my dream a reality. Those little things. And mm -hmm. for me to be able to, you know, do those things to kids and the next generation, that means everything. But ever since I was in third grade, basketball was the, my ultimate goal, to make it to the NBA. That's dope. Your name represents greatness in this game. Tell everyone how you actually got your name. It's two sides to it. So my dad's a Laker fan. He made a wager with one of his friends. If This is what they're telling me. So <laughs> this, is I, I, this is what they're telling me. On his name. They made, he made a wager with one of his friends that if, you know, the Pistons beat the Lakers, he would name me Isaiah Thomas. My mom loved the name, but she grew up in church. She wanted to spell it the biblical way. So right. it was two sides to it. My dad lost a bet. My dad, I mean, my mom loved the name, but she so got So the Lakers got, happened to get swept that year, right? Yeah, yeah, they got beat. And that's how your name you had. Yeah, to be. so that, that's the story that they got. <laughs> that's Who knows crazy, if it's true right? or not? But <laughs> <laughs> they, they, and then I happened to play hoops, so we took it and ran with it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's funny. What was the funniest ad mentioned on social media that you remember, but it was supposed to be directed at Isaiah Thomas, the OG? Man, when The Last Dance came out, they hated, they <laughs> hated they the OG. On you. <laughs> oh my God, that, that was on me though. Like, <laughs> so but when The Last Dance came out, oh my goodness. It was like, <laughs> for them, whatever, six straight weeks, every episode, oh, yeah, so. it was like, F you, F the bad boys. <laughs> then you got some yeah. hitting me like, your dad's a this and that. I'm like, I'm dad. just laughing at it. Cause right. I'm yeah. like, little did you know, like, I have nothing to do with <laughs> right. the bad boys, The Last Dance, right. I got nothing to do. That's not my pops. Right. But you know, that happened every now and then, especially mm -hmm. when I was, you know, when I was a little younger and, and Isaiah Thomas was on the Knicks. You know, they used to boo him when mm -hmm. he was the coach. Mm -hmm. I used to go to them games with Jamal, because J Jamal Crawford and Nate Robinson was on them teams. And it even started from there. The social media, they was like, they was, they be on his head. I be feeling bad. Because they be <laughs> on my head too sometimes, but a lot be directed at him yeah. just because of that MJ stuff. Yeah. That's funny. The culture in basketball, just the, the, the energy of, of the Pacific Northwest, particularly the Seattle area basketball, has been so strong. Um, what is it like out there in the summer? I mean, you guys probably have the most pros yeah. if you could think of it, but what are those summers? Like, I know Jamal runs a summer league, but what is that interaction like? Because you guys have so many people that played in the NBA that are going to the NBA yeah. and that have played in the NBA. Man, it's everything. And, you know, to, to answer the question first is, Doug Christie started that. You know, mm -hmm. Doug Christie was... Shout out Doug. He was the one that started that with Jamal and Jason Terry and those guys. And then it just trickled down. And I remember when I first met Jamal, I'd known Jason since I was in third grade. His dad coached me growing up in high school. Mm -hmm. So Jet always been a mentor of mine. But when I met Jamal, I was 15 years old. I met Jamal. I remember the, the, the things that those guys always told me. It was like, the things we do for you we want you to do for the next guys mm -hmm. coming up. That's how I go. And it's always been like that. And you know, in that area, it's been like that from Jamal Crawford, Jason Terry, you go Brandon Roy, Nate Robinson, Aaron Brooks, Spencer Haas, Martel Webster, the first mm -hmm. guy out, out of Seattle to go out of high school, straight out of high school to the NBA. And the list goes on. I mean, you got those older guys, then you got me, DeJounte Murray, Kevin Porter Jr., mm -hmm. Michael Porter Jr. Mm -hmm. played at one year high school in Seattle, so we're yeah. gonna, we gonna count him yeah. in. I'm, I know I'm missing a lot, but the McDaniels brothers that play right now, we got a, we got a young group of guys that, that are coming up as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, that, that circle is really tight. And like you said, the summertime's be 
Like when dudes get back home the next couple weeks, mm -hmm. you know, it's gonna be it's gonna Explain be like how you guys scene, had the, yeah. the runs at UCLA. Yeah. Explain the summer scene though, because the, the summer league is like you got have people from all over the, uh, the NBA, but all yeah. over the world coming out there to play in Jamal. Yeah, Jamal summer, summer league. league, and like I said, that started with Doug Christie back in the day, and okay. then it transferred over to Jamal, mm -hmm. which Doug gave it gave reins to Jamal, and Jamal has been. I mean, he's had you out there. He's had mm -hmm. he's had everybody out there, mm -hmm. and. That's the dope thing, because during the week we play, all the pros play, and then during the weekend is when Jamal has his his pro am. So mm -hmm. it's like all week we're hooping, Doing we're something. kicking it with each other. Right. It's real, it's a real brotherhood up there that, you know, unless you're in it, you can't, it's hard to explain it. Right. No, that's everybody's dope. super solid and super close. Because we went out there, I remember we went out there for uh, Jamal's wedding. The wedding. And, he, he and y'all played at midnight. Yeah, we had a midnight. And it was like 6,000 fans. And shit was sold out. But that's when I saw De DeJounte Murray for the first oh, time. Yeah, like, because he was this a high school. school kid who was nice as fuck. I'm like, all right. You know what I mean? I was already blown. I didn't really want to play anyway. It was <laughs> at midnight. You're just you're trying, you want me to stay sober the whole entire impossible. day? <laughs> that's impossible. Go stay at midnight. But anyway, we made it happen. But this young boy, DeJounte, he was incredible, yeah. bro. Like he's like a young Jamal watching. He had bounce too. This nigga was incredible. I think he was only a junior at the time. Yeah, too. he was he in high school. Killed I remember that, that game. But I remember that just like it was midnight and the gym was packed. That's how much love they had for Jamal. It was crazy. Yeah, but he did it for his wedding though. That yeah. was like one of his wedding. Yeah, events. that was his little. Like we all like Blake, DJ, everybody. We your whole team was there, there bro. The that whole thing was, team crazy. was out there. High school, you spent three years South Kent prep, and then you transferred. What made you go prep school? So prep school, I had to get my academics right oh, in order for me to accept yeah. the scholarship at University of Washington. So um, I did three years of high school at, back home. Um, I did two years. I did an extra year of high school at the prep school. So I had to get my grades right in order for me to accept the scholarship. And then once I was able to do that, which was probably the toughest thing I ever been through in terms of it was an all-boys school, mm -hmm. suit and tie every day. Mm -hmm. It was just different from where I came from. And then... At 16 years old, leaving, you know, my parents, leaving my close yeah, homies. I was going to ask, how tough was like, that? Like, that was tough. That's that was, that was a leader, cultural right? change for me. Like, right. it went from me having to wear a suit and tie every day to, you know, me being the man back home. Like, mm -hmm. that 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 was tough. But in order for me to accomplish my goal of, of making it to college and, you know, possibly making it to the NBA, I had to go do it. And mm -hmm. looking back at it now, that was probably one of the best decisions of my life because mm. it made me grow up faster than I needed to. I was on my own at 16. So, you know, from 16 on, I, I haven't been back home, you know, like we're living under my mm -hmm. parents. And I think that's helped me become, you know, the young man, I, the, the man I am today. And, you know, ultimately the father I am as well. So, mm. you know, it was, it was a good side a to blessing it. blessing in disguise. You know, yeah, at the time that, yeah. that shit was... Tough, I can imagine. It made me think. And you're like, going to go Connecticut is, is too, really right? I, yeah, I was in Connecticut, Ugh. the middle of nowhere. <laughs> but luckily, the good thing about that, Jamal and Nate played for the Knicks. Oh, so I would take the far. train up there on the yeah. weekends. Yeah, I would take yeah. the little train That'd be cool. over the White Plains for yeah. the weekend, and I, I was able to kick it with them. That's so. what's up, yeah. Who else was recruiting you besides Washington? So ultimately, um, before I committed to Washington, I was going to commit to Indiana. I wanted okay. to be Isaiah Thomas. Yeah. I wanted, I wanted yeah. to follow in that. They had a coach named Mike Davis, which was an mm -hmm. African-American coach that was, that was really good and gave me one of my first offers. He ended up getting fired, and I had to go in a different direction. And then I, if I wasn't going to go to Indiana, I wanted to stay home. And then, But when I went to prep school, that's when like UConn came on me, mm -hmm. all the East Coast right schools. The and I was thinking about opening my recruitment back up because, you know, I, I was never recruited by them schools. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, I wanted to go back to the crib at the end of the day. I wanted to be home. I took two years. I was two years away from home already. I was ready to get back home and, mm -hmm. you know, try to put on for for my town. And I was so. able to do that in a, in a cool, solid way. A lot of accolades, Pac-10 freshman of the year, tournament MVP. What was your college experience like that you were back at home and you were killing? Man, it was everything. Cause you know, before before I went there, shoot, we had Nate Robinson there, Will Conroy, Trey Simmons, um, Brandon Roy, Brandon Roy which is obviously the best, mm -hmm. you know, guy to come out of University of Washington. But you know, when I was headed back home, I was hyped because I was away for two years. Right. So I was hyped to be able to, you know, put on for the state of Washington, to to be able to, you know, go to a big time college and just hoop and be home at doing it. So it was it was Probably the best experience of my lifetime. Like, Ooh. college was so dope. Just, you know, lifelong friends that we still got group texts with with That's all my teammates. Up. And 
everything with being back home and going to college was everything I dreamed of. And we happened to be pretty good. Like we went uh -huh. to Sweet 16 one year. We went to NCAA tournament three years in a row. So it was, it was some success back home. And then, you know, ultimately I was able to get my jersey retired back in college. Mm -hmm. So it was shit that, you know, was happening that I didn't even dream of when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about your legendary shot you made in the Pac-10 tournament. So the shot, um, that was that was everything because obviously it was on national TV, championship game. Gus Johnson calling Gus again. Johnson mm -hmm. in Staples Center. You mm -hmm. know, Kobe's Pac my favorite tournament. player, so right. it was like that whole last possession, I was like, man, this is what Kobe did. This is what <laughs> I, And my coach, for the first time in my little college career, when I told him it's good, I got it, he was like, okay, go to work. Mm -hmm. And I was able to, you know, isolation play at the top of the key. I think yet the, the the day before Kimba Walker hit his step back. Yeah, he made a So it was ball, already right? in my mind that like, okay, I, I might coming. have to go to the step back. This is my chance. And you know, I did I did a little crossover. He sat on the crossover. The step back got me my separation. And once I shot it, you knew it was good. I knew it was going in. And mm -hmm. then it was just like, you know, everything you dreamed of being in outside at the park when you're a little counting down from ten, and you know, thinking you're Michael Jordan, thinking you're Michael mm -hmm. Jordan and Kobe. So that was. That was like a moment that, you know, I'm going to cherish forever, for yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. so, who asked did you bust in college that was memorable? Man, college was, college was tough. You know, I didn't really cook nobody like I was doing in the NBA in college. Yeah. You know, I didn't, I didn't, you know, college is a little, well, you didn't go to college, so. College <laughs> was, you know, it was, it, it's harder to score in college, I feel like, because it's it just, there's no space. Yeah. There's no space, no defense of three seconds in the key. So, obviously, I was doing well, but I, I didn't really cook nobody that, that I can remember. Obviously, the, the game-winning shot was probably my biggest moment, yeah. and I had a pretty good game that game, too, but it wasn't no game where it stood out where I was frying the next guard. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not even going to lie. Yeah, just, yeah. I, I could have just... But you saved that for the biggest stage. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the game winner was, I could say that was that was probably the, one of my Bunny best games, moments, for yeah. sure. So with all the accolades you acquired in college... And you end up being the last pick of the draft that after after you're done. What was that like? That was the longest day of my life. That was a that was a tough day, just because I probably I obviously going into the draft I knew I wasn't gonna be like I was I was projected to be early second round like that was the highest. So mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I'm solid with that. If I'm just given a, a a realistic chance, I'll take it and run with it. I probably had like 20 workouts, you know, that pre-draft. Mm, so I was lot. chasing everybody. Like mm -hmm. I was, I was just trying to just show everybody that I'm, I'm, I'm better than the next. Who were some of the guys you were working on in the draft? Who was in that draft with you? Man, so Kyrie Irving was number one. Okay. Obviously, he wasn't, he wasn't about to go against nobody. But Brandon Knight, I went against him. I went against a few second round guys that got picked ahead of me. Um, not to, you know, I don't want to put no names out there. <laughs> we ain't on that. But I destroyed dudes. I destroyed them. I destroyed them. I mean, I'm not even like I'm not even gonna sugarcoat it. I destroyed them, and that's why it was frustrating on draft night. Cause mm -hmm. I'm like, dang, what else do they want? Like we went head to head. Guys is getting drafted before me. I've had better college careers than them, and it was just tough. But you know, at the end of the day, I was like, okay, if I'm drafted, that's all I ever asked for was a chance. Right. Sacramento, which was my first workout in 2011. I forgot all about them. After the Lakers, they had four second round picks. And I thought at least one of those picks was gonna be me. And once they picked two guards with I think like the 52nd pick, 54th pick, my mind started to race like, dang, I'm probably not gonna get drafted. Mm. Cause I forgot about Sack. And then my agent called me like the 58th pick. They, he like, Sack's gonna draft you with the last pick. And that's when I was like, cool, I'm not even tripping. Mm. If, if they give me a chance, that's all you need. I'm prepared. I know what I, I know what to do with it. And then, you know, my back was against the wall because that year was the lockout year. Mm -hmm. We didn't have no summer league. So, you know, summer league is where I could have got busy and, you know, got a guaranteed deal. So right. I went all the way into, shit, the lockout was over, like, I think the day before Christmas, Christmas or something. Christmas, mm hmm Got invited to training camp, and then it was all she wrote after that. Like, I was able to get a solid opportunity to show, you know, I can play at this level. Mm -hmm. And... You know, every step of the way, that's all I did. I just prepared myself, and then when my name was called, I took advantage. Mm. What was your welcome to the NBA moment? My welcome to the NBA moment 
was, so the first game of the season, we played the Lakers. Um, Kobe Bryant, obviously my favorite player ever. There was a rule in training camp, Paul Westfall, rest in peace. Guys would try to back me down and they would just always turn the ball over for whatever reason. Like, I'm not saying I'm super defender. It's just they would, they would try to exploit, you know, the mismatch, but always seem to turn the ball over or take a bad shot. So in training camp, Paul Westfall was like, nobody's backing down IT. Like, don't do it. Or you're, you know, you're getting subbed out. So when Paul Westfall put me in the game, I remember the second quarter, he's naming who everybody got. And then I'm like, coach, who do I got? He's like, you got Kobe. And remember, nobody can back you down. I'm like, <laughs> trying to guess. Like, it, it was funny because I was like, I appreciate you putting me in, but bro, Kobe's backing everybody down. Like, it didn't, it didn't matter. So the first three <laughs> possessions, they do a little ISO. I'm, I'm over behind Kobe just smiling. Like, I'm like, I'm smiling, <laughs> trying to guard him, knowing he's about to fade away. He hits two out of three shots. The first shot he hit, I'm sprinting down court just laughing like, damn, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Like, yeah. the first time in my life where somebody scored on me, I was like, I was, I was smiling and happy about it because, you know, that was my favorite player. Right. So it was like even touching his jersey, I was like, damn, I made it. Like, <laughs> you can hit this fade away on me all game. Like, I'll be solid. <laughs> and that was my welcome to the NBA moment. Yeah, Paul Westfall bro. throwing me in there and being Hell like, yeah. nobody could back you down. And me having to guard Kobe the first three possessions of my NBA career. So That's that was, funny. How many, you remember how many he had that game? I don't remember how many he had, but he had four on me. He had two. He was two for three. <laughs> yeah. He was two for three on me. So that was... That was my little welcome to the NBA moment for sure. What was the state of the Kings at that time? You guys had a lot of young talent. Yeah, we was, man, we had DeMarcus Cousins, Rudy Gay. Mm -hmm. um, we, had, we had a talented team, like, but like you said, we was young. We was young. I think it was three or four coaches in my three years there, so there was no like stability there. And it was just tough. I mean, you guys know, being on a young team, having, having different coaches, there's no structure. So that was that was probably the toughest part because we had the talent. We just couldn't put it together. Mm -hmm. We just couldn't put it together. But my experience in SAC, they gave me my first chance. Them fans in SAC are amazing. Right, right. The community in mm -hmm. SAC, like, I fell in love with Sacramento. Like, mm -hmm. that will always be, you know, a special place in yeah. my heart for sure because they gave me my first. Yeah, yeah, shout out to your hometown. They gave me my first, they gave me my first opportunity and, you know, I tried to take it and run with it. Talk to us about how good Boogie was. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. He was every big before before what they're doing now. And B, Joker. Better he than was, AD. Yeah, yeah, he was with better all than due, AD. With all due respect. With all due respect. But he was, you know, what they are now. Like, he was the point center. Killing, yeah. yeah, doing it all. He was doing everything. And it was, that's the frustrating part because he was doing so much, but there was no way we was... We just wasn't built to win. Just was, yeah. And it was just a waste of years for him because, as you guys know, them first few years, like, obviously everybody's trying to get paid, but that was like a generational talent, mm, you know, before killer. he got hurt. Mm -hmm. He was, I mean, he was what MB's doing. He could bang with you. He could take you to the wing. He could, but more fluid with it, though. Yeah, yeah, way, yeah. way, way yeah. more fluid. And, right. you know, Boogie's, that's, that's my dog, and yeah. he did it. You know his way, like he yeah. did it. <laughs> like it wasn't gonna that's be a, no other way, but he is. Hey, you say know, it. right? You can only thing you can do is respect that. He didn't change for nobody, mm -hmm. right? And you know that's that's my dog, and I, I'm happy to see him. You know, in a winning situation where he could, you know, possibly win a championship. I think, we got, I think he got some good games to add him. Oh, no, nah, he, you know he, he got, got some. Yeah. He's in a good situation mm -hmm. right now where they rock with him too. Absolutely, so, it's important. You know, that's all it's about. Mike Malone, what kind of coach was he? What was y'all connection like? Mike was. A player's coach. Yeah. He was he was for the culture for sure. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the first coach that DeMarcus, you know, somewhat respected, you know, from day one. And and I think, you know, you see what he's doing in Denver right now, it's like it's obvious because he's a player's coach. He yeah. relates to the yeah. players. And he's been like that ever since, you know, he's been an assistant in the league. His dad was a coach with the with the bad boys. Um, so it's it's installed in him to be that and He's a hell of a coach, man. He let me rock out. My mm. third year was kind of like my breakout year. You know, I averaged 20 points, six assists, and I had a lot to do with him. I mm. remember one conversation he had with me at one point in my third year because everybody was in my ear about, you know, trying to be a pass first point guard. That's just never been who I am. Right. Like, I'm a scoring guard that makes plays. And 
I remember one time he brought me aside. He's like, bro, you can't be John Stockton. There's no way. You're not going to be him. Be you mm -hmm. and be who Isaiah Thomas is. And, you know, ever since that day, I kind of took that, you know, that confidence that he instilled in me and ran with it. Because, you know, all, all the NBA is about is opportunity and situation. Right. Everybody got hoop game. If, you, if you're put in the right situation where there's confidence poured into you, Nine times out of ten, you're going to succeed. You'll be all right, yeah. For sure. That's what people don't understand, though, is that Kai had a situation like that in Golden State that the team Jack and I played on, but yeah. Nelly was like the first coach, like, just go out there and play. I don't care if you make a mistake, just yeah. play hard. And when you hear a coach tell you, like, really, what? Yeah. That's all you need to hear. I mean, the coach, you know, all due respect to every coach out there, but, you know, that could be the best defender for most players. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, he could be first team all defense. Mm, for real. No bullshit. Yeah. You, you know, and you got to, you know, somehow figure out ways to to get past those, but, you know, sometimes that should be tough. Mm -hmm. You break out with the career, your third year, 20.6 assists, you're part of a sign-in trade to Phoenix. Talk to us about that. Was that blind side? Are you expecting that? No, it was because I signed with Phoenix um, in a free agent, and then they had to work the sign-in trade. Oh, okay. So I, I knew that was going to happen. I was surprised that I didn't go back to SAC. That was probably the biggest surprise because I felt like with them bringing guards in every year, and then me sending them out. <laughs> I feel like that was enough for right. three straight years. Right. But, you know, obviously, change of heart, whatever the situation may be. I go to Phoenix. We end up having three guards. Bless old Dragic. Dragic just come off third team all NBA. He had a hell of a year. They almost make the playoffs. I'm playing well that year. Obviously, we're, we're playing well. I think we're seventh in the, in the West before the trade deadline happened in the trade. But it was just, it was before, you know, now where three or four guards can play with each other at the same time. It was just tough, like, because every night somebody was upset, obviously, because right. we had Dragic, Bledsoe, me. We also had Gerald Green, too. So, like, me and Gerald was coming off the bench, and there would be some nights where we were in the game. And obviously, mm -hmm. they just played Bled. They, they trying to pay Dragic, so they're they going to be hot. You right. know, if they don't end the game. So it was heated at times. Not between us though, not between the players. Obviously right. we had we was we was solid. That was one of my, you know, my best teams I've been on in terms of the guys on the team, the camaraderie we had. Everybody, everybody messed with each other. And Phoenix um, is a cool city. And Phoenix is, too. you know, Hell Phoenix cool. is all loved here. Hell so yeah. then, you know, and then I get traded in the middle of the year to where mm -hmm. it was a blessing in disguise. Obviously, I get traded to Boston. Mm -hmm. and, and, it was all she wrote after that. I mean, obviously, you're, you're, you, you continue to improve, and everything kind of comes together in Boston, um, you know, with the historical franchise. Talk to us about, obviously, being there and then how things just kind of continue to transpire for you. So for me, going to Boston, um, I, was caught, I was caught off guard with that trade midseason because we was in the playoff race. Uh, we knew Dragic demanded a trade, so we were waiting on that. And then when that happened, like five minutes later, agent calls, he's like, you about to get traded to Boston. I'm like, damn, I'm already thinking they just traded Rondo, so they rebuilding. Like, this would be my first time even possibly making the playoffs if I stay with Phoenix. So I was hot at the situation because I knew they were in rebuild mode, and I'm like, man, I, I don't want to be on a bad team again. Mm -hmm. But I remember the first person calling me after the trade, OG Isaiah Thomas, he's like, you might not think it now, but this is going to be the best, mm. this is the best, you know, situation for your career. And at that time, I'm like, damn, bro, I'm in Phoenix. It's hot. I don't even got a coat. <laughs> Boston is rebuilding. It's cold as hell out there. I'm like, man, I don't want to go. This is before I talked to Danny, talked to Brad, all them. So then I get traded there, and then I just, you know, genuinely it, it worked out. Like, they needed somebody like me. I needed somebody like them that was going to give me a chance to go rock out. And then I was able to do that. Brad put the ball in my hands. And, you know, it was, for three years, it was it was everything I dreamed of, you mm -hmm. know, being the man. Mm -hmm. Obviously, from the jump, it wasn't like that. I was a sixth man the first year. The second year. So who was on the team when you first got there? The, the starters. So it was Marcus Smart, Avery Bradley, and that was Smart's rookie year. Avery Bradley... And then I forgot who else started after. Evan Turner was there. Mm -hmm. Evan Turner. And those were the guards. So my first year, I was thinking when I got traded, I'm like, okay, I'm coming in starting. Cool. They say I was coming off the bench. I was fine with that. I ended up playing really well at the end of the year. We ended up going to the playoffs, getting swept by Cleveland. Mm -hmm. Fast forward the second year, which was my first all-star year. 
I remember Brad Stevens coming to me in preseason, and he's like, man, you, you're obviously our best player, but for this team, it'd be best for you to come off the bench. And mm-hmm. I was like, mm-hmm. like that hurt me, because I worked hella hard that summer. I'm like, this is a good opportunity. I'm going to be starting. It hurt, but I'm like, okay, I get it. It's all good. I would Two games that. into the season, <laughs> Smart ended up getting hurt one game. I don't know how. He like messed up his toe, shoot around. He like, I'm not playing. Brad's like, you're going to start tonight, but this ain't permanent. Because they knew when, when, when they, when they said they I was start, I'm like, okay, I'm going to take it and run with it. Take it and run with it. They like, it's not permanent. Smart come back, you're going to go back to it. I'm like, okay. Smart comes back in two games, but those two games I had 31 and 29. <laughs> <laughs> Avery ended up getting hurt. So I stay in the starting lineup, perfect. and then it was over after that. Like mm. I, little, little little people know that the start that year, I was supposed to come off the bench. Mm. My first All-Star year. And then the, those two little and injuries two happened. And you starts, you averaged 30. And then it was over. And then, you know, I took that opportunity and ran with it. I, I ended up, you know, making my first All-Star game, which was crazy because it was Kobe's last All-Star game in Toronto. So mm. it was just, you know, I always dreamed of that happening. No I don't. I didn't know if it was gonna happen. I didn't know if that opportunity was ever gonna come. But I knew one thing: I was gonna be prepared for it if it did. And then my third year, which was my second All Star year, the game just got the game just slowed down for me. Like it was just so easy after that. No disrespect to nobody. It was just I knew every night I was gonna get thirty, mm-hmm. just because I had the opportunity and I prepared for it. Like I knew where my shots was coming from. I knew. I knew all of that, and I prepared. Like I said, I prepared for those moments. I always dreamed about being the man, being on one of the best teams in the NBA, and having that opportunity. And then when it came, one thing that I do regret, those opportunities, I never, like, I never, I guess, appreciate, not appreciate them. I was so locked in the moment yeah, right. that I was like, man, nah, I, like the Enjoying games I had 50, really? I'm like, fuck, I should have had 60. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. I never enjoyed those moments because I was just so locked into what's next. Yeah. And I always say like, I think I was just so paranoid because, you know, nothing was ever given to me. So I was always just like, I might go back to bench tomorrow. You know, mm-hmm. like that was my mindset. So those three years in Boston were everything to me. They, were, they, 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 they allowed me to reach heights that I only dreamed of, and they allowed me to reach, you know, be able to inspire so many kids that look like me, that's my height, that they never get a real chance. So, you know, that's what that was for. When I was able to hit the top like that, it was like, it was for the next little dude that has a, that has a problem getting his foot in the league, mm-hmm. you know, showing that a little dude can have the number one record in the NBA, to be the number one seed, to take a team to the conference finals. Like, that can happen. Right. You know, when it's not normal, they don't like that. Right. So that's that. That's the hardest part. So, you know, that was my motivation to, to make it easier for the, you know, the guys coming behind me. Mm-hmm. So fast forward into the playoffs of 17, you tragically lose your sister. Um Talk to us about that moment, that experience. I lost my mom at the beginning of my, after the We Believe season, like diagnosed with cancer on November 1st, died the 27th, and I was out of it. The whole year was kind of a wash. Uh, you were able to, through the grace of God, continue on and, and actually play great. But talk to us just about that experience and how important she was to you. Man, that was, I, I always tell people, that was the best year of my career, but the worst year of my life. Right. You know, like that mm. was... That was real life shit that I went through, and that that I mean, you know, it still it still hurts me to this day. But I think the thing that kept me going was like basketball has been the only thing that ever keep me going when I'm going through some real shit. Mm-hmm. So like, people always ask me, "How did you play?" It was like that was the only option. That was the only thing to do. I was, yeah, I wasn't about to be at the house and just crying the whole time. Mm-hmm. Like that was my two three hours where you know I can get that off my mind. But then, obviously, at the end of the game, real life hit. Like, when I'm going back home, it's just... Mm-hmm. Back to I'm, the real world. Yeah, it's, it's back to, to she's not here. So, obviously, my teammates, the organization, my family, you know, everybody in my immediate circle helped me throughout that, throughout that time. That was, the, that was the toughest time of my life. But to answer your question, basketball was the only thing that I could possibly do to, mm. to be solid for the most part. And... That was all her. That was all God. Like, you know, I was, my hip was fucked up. 
I was battling, and I wasn't just battling on the court. I was battling mm-hmm. in real life, mm-hmm. and that that was that was the hardest part. And you know, knowing the season I had and how many people I was reaching to inspire, that's why I kept going. Mm-hmm. I'm like, bro, this can change somebody's life. Mm-hmm. You know, that that's going through some real shit to give them the courage to keep going. And you know, that's all I did. Obviously, I hurt myself even more. Mm. I fucked up my money. <laughs> mm. But in that moment, right. there was no other way. Like if right. I if I had to do it again, I I, I would probably yeah. do it again because that was the only thing that that helped me through that, you know, the toughest time of my life. And you know, you you take the good with the bad when it comes to stuff like that. Right. You dropped 33 hours after hearing this news, uh rally your team back from a 0-2 deficit to beat the Bulls, win the second round going to the conference finals against Cleveland. And like you said, fucked your hip up, yeah. but kept pressed. Because sometimes we're our, our own worst enemies. For sure. And you know you're on the brink of consistent all-star, MVP conversation. That big paycheck is right around the corner. That $150 yeah. million is, is right around the corner. That competitor in you wouldn't let you stop. Talk to us about just getting to that conference finals and then being heard and then kind of the trickle-down effect after that. So I hurt myself back in March. Carl Anthony Towns had fell on me. Mm. Um, tweaked my hip a little bit. But at that point in time, I only messed my knee up. Like, I sprained my knee. My hip was like, I didn't feel nothing. To a couple weeks later where I just, I felt some discomfort in my hip. It wasn't nothing crazy. We took MRIs, everything was solid, boom. Once we hit the playoffs, the tragic news happened. My hip was slowly getting a little worse. The only thing that I would that I would have against Boston, you know, everybody hated Boston for what they did to me. It's a business, I understand it. I'm not tripping on it. The only thing that I I think they handled wrong was not explaining to me what the extent of my injury could be if I do play. Mm. Yeah. So that that That's huge. that was that was the biggest thing for me that I did that I disliked. Because nobody gave me no insight. Okay, if you do play, right. this can happen. We right. have to we have to hear that. Because if you On tell everything. us, uh, it's going to be sore. Because it was a bone bruise. Right. At the end of the day, it was a bone bruise. Right. Like, that's what they said. Mm-hmm. You know? So, if you're going to tell me it's a bone bruise, play I'm playing 10 times as a team. Right. Like, I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to get through that. So, that was probably the only thing that I wish they would have done different. And I would have really sat down and really asked those questions. Like, what worst case scenario, what could happen? Obviously that didn't happen. Fast forward, I keep playing to game two of the Eastern Conference Finals. I remember no disrespect to Darren Williams, but he was on his way out. Like he was getting a little slower. I do a move and he just, he's just staying in front. I'm like, damn, I'm I'm kind of fast and quick. I'm like, <laughs> damn, like what happened? And I just felt like a shot in my, like in in my in my side, and I'm like, I tell the side, I'm like, it might be over because I couldn't push off no more. And then, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. halftime comes and that's when they shut it down. They're like, you're done. And I'm like, I couldn't, I couldn't move. Fast forward, I'm done for the season. We go take a look at um, some, some surgeons to see if I needed surgery. The best option was to wait it out, to let, you know, the swelling go down, see, see, let the summer go by and then see what I have. Then I get traded to Cleveland. Hmm. So that that's what hurt me the most, because they know... All the shit you went through. I went through. Like, I, I played with my sister. That was my decision, so that's not on them. The only thing that I would put on them is they didn't give me the extent of my injury. That's the only thing. But I decided to play, so I'll take that hit. You said the payday. Obviously, that's in the back of my head. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about... Come on, man. Number six. Shit, 150. Six, like, I was going to be a, a max player. So to keep it real, I'm like... Shit, I got to play. Like, you know, I'm 5'9". If I don't play, they're going to forget about me. That's how I always felt, just being a, the smaller guard. So I played through it, hurt myself even more. Fast forward to August. Out of nowhere, Danny calls me like, Damn. asked me how my day was, this and that. And I'm like, okay, everything's solid. He's like, IT, I just traded you. I'm like, to where? He's like, Cleveland for Kyrie. And then, you know, obviously, I i mean, it just don't seem real that at that point in time, I get off the phone with him, I tell my wife, 
tell my family, and I'm like, the only thing that, that made me hot about it, I think if, if I wasn't injured and I got traded, I would be like, cool, I'm not tripping. Shit, I'm going to play with Brian. We got a chance to win a championship. The fact that I was injured hurt me. Like, it hurt me. I'm a human at the end of the day. And the fact that they knew how bad my hip was and to trade me on that, that hurt. So, you know, there was a lot of people that, you know, was like, man, he should stop crying. He, it was like, I, first off, I wasn't the one bringing it up. The media was. I just answered the questions. Mm -hmm. And then second off, it was just like, at the end of the day, like, don't forget, like, I got real feelings. Like, I'm human at the end of the day. I'm not just a basketball player. So for right. them to trade me when I did get hurt on their watch, that was hurtful. But then after that, you know, I moved on. Like, I was able to rehab for like six months, play in January. I think I played 12, 13 games. It wasn't playing like they thought it was. They traded me to the Lakers. And then, you know, you go from being an all-star and MVP to, you know, being on a rebuilding Laker team that's not trying to make the playoffs in less than a year. That, that, was, that was a lot for me. And then, like I told you guys earlier, dealing with pain every day, mm -hmm. like, <laughs> man, I was going through it. Like, and That's at the end of the day, my sister still ain't around. Right. Like, so I'm still trying to figure that out. So for like two, three years straight, man, every day was a battle for me. Like, you know, not just hoop-wise, the health-wise. And nice. that, like, I don't think people necessarily always understand that. Like, it wasn't even about hoop at that point. It was about, you know, every day trying to be in a good mood and have no pain. Yeah. So you decided, obviously, just to let, to wait it out then the first time around? So the first time around, I decided to wait it out because I'm like, okay, the first option was to wait it out, see what it's going to be like when the when the um, wait, swelling goes out. I don't out. mean to cut you off. When did you find out how serious it was? When you heard it the second time or do you still didn't know how serious no, it was? No, so when I heard it the second time when I was done with the season, we went to the best hip specialist. And that's when it was like, they've never seen cartilage oh, go away man. that quick. That's crazy. So it went from in March... My shit was a normal hit to right. bone on bone Damn. in June. Mm. Like that's three months. Right. So in June, when I went, when we went to go, you know, to the top hip specialist, hip specialist in New York, that's when I knew I'm like, you feel me? My hip is messed up. So I got to figure out what's the best, what's the best option for me going forward. The number one option was the surgery I just got last year, but nobody got it. So I'm like. I'm not about to be the experiment. Dummy, right? Yeah, I'm not about dummy. to, especially when my career's on the line. Like, I'm trying to get paid next year. At the end of the day, it was like, bro, it's I got to be available to get paid next year. Mm -hmm. No matter what it is, whether it's max, whether it's a one-year contract. Paid, regardless. Whatever it is. Right. So I was like, I can't have an option of surgery because I'm going to have to sit out the whole year. It's a whole, so how long is it? was the process? So it's really eight to ten months. Mm, damn. You know, so that was the, I would have basically sat the whole year and went into free agency not playing yeah. off a of surgery that off a hip surgery, they yeah. haven't really mm -hmm. seen nobody come off of. So then I rehab that year, play for the Cavs, 14 games, get traded, play a few games for the Lakers. I'm playing a little better for the Lakers, but then like my hip just still messed up. So I'm like, I talk it over with my close circle of, of people. I decide to just do an arthroscopic surgery, try to clean it out and see if that would help. That shit made it worse. Yeah. Mm. That shit made it worse. I rehab for like 10 months, and that's supposed to be like a four-month rehab. It made it worse. I signed with Denver that year, the one year, the one year bet minimum. I don't play into February that year. They allowed me to take my whole time, so I appreciate the Denver Nuggets so much because... They didn't pressure me into playing at all. They allowed me to take my time. Then, you know, I'm feeling cool, but I'm just not myself. And right. it's obvious. Like, I'm, I'm a shell of myself. And I'm, I'm having to tell people I'm cool to get by. Obviously, I'm 5'9", on an injured hip. Like, you know, I'm not really even supposed to be in the NBA at this point because I can't be myself. I'm not quick. I'm not fast. I'm not who, you know, was able to be all-stars. I'm not that no more. So then fast forward, I sign with the Wizards. I, I start, I play 42 games. I start 40 of them. I'm playing solid, but still not great. Like when you're little, you gotta be exceptional. You gotta, every night gotta be special. And that wasn't me. They trade me to the Clippers, I get waived. 
Mm. Fast forward, the pandemic happened. Everything shuts down. And I, that's when I, I had a heart to heart with myself. Like, okay. That's tough. We gonna ride this out and try to just force it and see if we can get on a team or I'm gonna fix my ultimate problem. And then, you know, I sat down with the surgeon and that was the best decision of my life. It changed my whole life, you know, whether I'm on an NBA team or not. My daily life, I have no pain no more. I got 100% range of motion. My surgical hip is better than my, my, my you know, my, my normal hip. It changed my whole life. It, it, it got my mental in a space where nobody can ever take that from me again. And when you get that shot, you, you capable of taking care of it completely now. You know what I'm I mean? Good. Yeah, yeah. And that's yeah. why that's why I'm really yeah. not tripping on anything. Cause right. I'm like, I know when it does come, like a real legit chance, I'ma be, I'm gonna be prepared and take advantage of yeah. it. Yeah. Before it was like the cards had to be perfect. Yeah. Like I, I had to be walking into some minutes. You wasn't unsure. You was yeah, unsure. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't I, I was I was basically telling them I was good and knowing I wasn't. Right, yeah, yeah. So everything yeah. had to be perfect. It had to be, okay, I'm going I'm to be a starter, I'm going to be a six-man, I'm going to play 25 minutes. Now I know what I can work with. Yeah. Now it's like, you put me in any situation. If you really give me a chance, I'm going to show you because I'm healthy. Right. And I'm only 32 years old. Yeah. Like, I really haven't played in three years. Mm -hmm. So it's not like I was... I was banging my body and, and playing the last 82 games every year. Like, I really haven't hooped hoops. Yeah. In two, two and a half years. Yeah. You know, so I'm ready to go. There's something about us, man. When we play hurt, we on the outside in the shell, we physically like, yeah, man, we can do it. But in the back of our mind, we're like, man, why am I out here? I'm hurt. You and know that's what, what it was. Every game, I'm like, <laughs> I got to fake it, but I know deep down, like, I'm, I just don't got it. I, mean, hurt, I, was, bro. I was relying on the jump shot at 5'9". It's like my strength is going in the, in the, in the paint and making shit happen. Yeah. I couldn't do what I've always done. Mm. So that was the most frustrating part. And then, you know, like I said, once the pandemic hit, I had to be real with myself. I'm like, okay, we're going to either get the surgery or you're going to have to thug it out and live with the consequences. Yeah. And the surgery was like, okay, it's going to scare some people, but at the end of the day, I'm going to be healthy. And all I need is one, one, one person to give me a chance. Yeah. And it took me six months to get back. So, you know, I told you eight to 10 months. It was six days a week for seven straight months mm -hmm. in rehab. Because mm -hmm. I knew it was at stake. It's like, this is my career on the line. Mm -hmm. And I love this shit. So I'm going to do whatever it takes to, you know, get, back. get it back. And I'm here today. You know, I obviously, I obviously want to be on a team, but I know when my name is called, it's go time. And I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah, ready to go, ready. For, yeah. for real. So you've gone into great detail about the physical pain and day-to-day and, -day and even playing, but talk to us about that mental, because you said your mental is right and in, 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 in where you are mentally, because I'm sure the mental was more fucked up than your actual pain yeah, was. Yeah, the pain was obviously there, but the mental was like, I couldn't hide that. Mm. I couldn't fake that. Like, you couldn't... You got to get through that somehow. And, you know, with... Everything happening back to back, my sister, me getting hurt, getting traded three or four times in that small span of time. Like You start to question yourself. Yeah. For the first time Anybody in my would. life. Yeah. Like I'm, yeah, I'm like, damn, like, damn, like is, lot, it, is it is it plate. over? Or is this do I just gotta do something else? And it was a lot for me. The mental part cooked me. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I always was like, Hoop is what I love, so if until I can't do it no more, I'm going to try. Mm -hmm. And I always told people, I'm like, the easy thing to do at the end of the day is to quit. Just like, easy, anybody man. can walk in and quit and be like, I'm going to throw the towel in, I'm tapping out. The hard thing to do is when some, some real adversity hits you to, to be like, okay, how do I get through that wall? How do I get through that adversity? Mm -hmm. And I just stayed down. I stayed solid. I had the right people around me. Um, I remember D. Rose telling me when we was... D. Rose is one of my close homies. And he told me when he was going through his shit, he was like, I was trying to fight against everybody. Mm. And once I let that fight go, my mental just eased up. Mm. And I was able to get through it all. Mm -hmm. And once, you know, during that time with Cleveland and jumping the teams and chasing that, that max, once I was done with that, like, and I had no more fight to, to prove to people, I was like, my mental just slowed all the way down. And then 
shit, I did the surgery, I had no pain no more. I'm like, my money's good, I'm, I'm, I'm straight. My mm -hmm. kids is healthy. But one thing that kept me going was my little boys was watching me every yeah. day. Yeah, that's big. Even though they would, they would make jokes about, oh, you're not in the league no more, you're not. Mm -hmm. You used to be, you, you miss everything now. You used to make everything in Boston. Like those, that's what kept me going. Because mm -hmm. I knew if I did lay down and tap out, at some point in their life, they're gonna tap out when some mm. shit get real. That's, that's that's why we commend you, bro. That's another reason why we want we want to have you on the show because we like giving giving our brothers out that they flowers. I know a lot of times, bro, I could be arguing with my girl, and I go to the game and I'm I'm not there. You know what I'm saying? For I'm, real. Just from an argument at home, yes. I can't go out and perform. So. I commend you, bro, because to, to, for everything you've been through and, and to be able to perform and to still walk around with your chin up, knowing how, how even though we know it's not fair, yeah. but to still be strong, it take a lot, bro. And a lot of people that's on the outside looking in would never understand mm -mm. how hard that is. Not at all. And, and, like, and that's the mental side of it. Like, we ain't even talking about the physical. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. Like, what you got to fight and work out every day and mm -hmm. grind, and, and then you're playing against the best players in the world. Like my physical wasn't there and my mental was checking yeah, out. Yeah. So like I was I was going through it, but you know, they like they say they it can't storm forever. Right. You know, at some point the sun gotta come out, and I really felt that. And then having mentors like R.I.P. Kobe, yeah. R.I.P. Nipsey Hustle, yeah. and really taking that marathon lifestyle and knowing, okay, there's gonna be bumps in the road, there's yeah. gonna be tough times, you're gonna hit adversity. But at the end of it, when you fight through that and you run through that wall. The only thing you can do is have your chin up and no your chest feeling out. Like it, yeah. I mean, nobody can tell me nothing no more. Yeah. Like I've been through it, and I came out of it. You mm -hmm. feel me? With my mental right, didn't do no no goofy shit, didn't do no lame, nothing lame. Mm -hmm. I just stayed true to myself, and yeah. I stayed solid, and I just kept working. And you know, I know at some point that opportunity is gonna come because I never cheated the game not one time. And I know it's gonna come, and when it does, I'm gonna take it and run with it, and I'm gonna just smile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna be like I told you so. I'm not gonna shit on nobody. Yeah. I'm gonna just smile and be appreciative and be like, you know, for the people that's looking, that's behind me, I'm gonna be like, this is for you guys. Yeah. Because when you hit adversity, the best thing to do is just run through it. Mm -hmm. Find a way. Got to. Ain't no choice. Uh, you get a chance to play for the U.S. basketball team. How good was it to get out there, play with Joe, but just get out there and really play again pain-free? Man, it was everything because, you know, a lot of people be like, why are you going to play the USA? You was this and that. It's like, I got no pride for this game. Right. Like, this game blessed me with, you know, to have some money, to have to take care of my family. Like, I got no pride when it comes to hoop. I go. But how is that bad, though? You yeah, like, like how you? is that bad? There's so many people That's, are so out come the on, loop, man. bro. I'm going to Puerto Rico to play for the USA team. It didn't matter. Me and Joe was laughing about that. Like, when they hit him for it, he's like, hell yeah. Like, to, to hoop for free, I mean, to hoop and go to Puerto Rico, travel the world, like, only real hoopers know that. Yeah. Though. Like, I ain't yeah. got no pride. Like, when I'm really done, I'm going to be hooping in the big three. You right. feel me? Like, exactly. there's no pride about that. That's hoop That's against real is. hoopers. Yeah. Like, so when I when I got the chance to, to play... Ice Cube just got excited. Go ahead. <laughs> no, man, you know he's going to get the touch. He already know. He probably heard you. <laughs> when, 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 <laughs> when I got the chance to play for Team USA in Puerto Rico, it was a no-brainer. When they asked, I'm like, bro, it gave me an opportunity to show that I'm healthy. Yeah. It gave me an opportunity to play basketball on the team. And I just took it and ran with it. I took took it for what it was, and it was to go out there and play basketball. You and, it for your benefit. And that's what I did, and I was happy about that. And it, shit, it got me an opportunity with the Pelicans, you yeah. know, a, a month later. It got yeah. me a little cool 10-day with the Pelicans. And, and, you know, that's just what I got to do to get back in, and I'm cool with it. Mm -hmm. Yes, I love it. You mentioned uh, our brother, rest in peace, Nipsey Hussle. You guys had a particularly close relationship. Uh, uh, relationship. Talk to us about the relationship and what, what it was like. Man, I met Nipsey back in 2009 when I was in college. He used to do shows up in Seattle. And I had a teammate that was from the Crenshaw District that put me on Nipsey, which is, his name is Darnell Gant. Um, he went to Crenshaw High School and everything. He's the first one to put me on Nipsey's music back in 08. 09, you know, we, we communicated on Twitter somehow. Um, we exchanged information. He came to Seattle, gave me some tickets. I got to chop it up with him, and then ever since then, we was, you know, we've been close. And he's just somebody that, you know, it's easy to relate to, no matter, you know, what walk of life you are, what he stood for, you can relate to if you're on the everyday grind, mm -hmm. you know. And I spoke about, you know, what he called the marathon, you know, it's a lifestyle. And he's somebody that, you know, one of my mentors, somebody that, 
you know, if I needed game on anything, you know, life, about, you know, the mental part of things, about keep going and running your race, that's somebody I always chopped it up with and somebody that always gave me real genuine game, no matter what the circumstances was. And, you know, it's rest in peace to him forever and somebody that, you know, left a, a huge mark on society, on the culture mm -hmm. of, you know, where, you know, guys like like us come from. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he lived he lived life the right way. And I think that's why so many people can not relate to, you know, what he stood for. What's the best piece of advice he ever gave you? I think just to never give up. Mm -hmm. You know, your race is your race. I remember one time he telling me, your race is your race. Don't ever compare it to nobody else's. Hmm. And I think throughout my whole career, I always took that and ran with it. Because, you know, it's, especially in our profession, it's hard to not compare yourself to the next dude. Right. Especially when dudes are getting paid and you play the same position and you're producing the same. But once he told me that back in, like, before I got to the league, I took that and ran with it. I, I was never worried about what the next man was doing. I was always worried about and focused on you know, my marathon and my mm -hmm. race because my shit is going to be different than anybody else's. Mm -hmm. So how can I compare mine to somebody else when we're running two different marathons, two different races? And I think that's probably the best advice he gave me, and, I, you know, I, I take it in to this day. Mm -hmm. Rest in peace to the homie. Yep. From one father legend to another, uh, Cove, you wore his number when you had your brief 10-day with the Pelicans. Talk to us about <clears throat> what he meant to you and some experience you had with Cove. Man, Kobe meant everything to me. Kobe was... I see you light he, up. Yeah, yeah, Kobe was name, my Michael yeah. Jordan. Right. You know, mm -hmm. Kobe was, like I said, my, my, my family's from Inglewood, so I was brainwashed into being a Laker fan. So in 96, I was seven years old, and knowing who Kobe was, getting drafted, Shaq just came over. Like, that was my childhood, right. you know, being you able to... You were six when, I, when we graduated? Seven, yeah, man, 97. Yeah. I mean, 96. I was seven years old. Hey, I feel old, yeah. <laughs> That's how when I got my 10-day, I'm only 32 now. When I got my 10-day, a young dude called me OG. I'm like, bro, don't do that. <laughs> he wasn't really yeah, don't do that one yet. We gonna wait, yet. You were going to wait a few years, fam. <laughs> you gotta then I asked 40. him how old he was. He's like, I'm 20. I'm like, damn. I, yeah, you got to right? touch 40 for yeah, you. Yeah, you yeah, I was 40. like, I feel but you, but I'm not that yet. He was born in the 2000s, though. Yeah, he was. I was like, I'm not that yet. But Kobe... You know, he was everything to my life, not just who. You know, I wanted to be him. I knew I wasn't just because I, was, I wasn't going to be 6'6". Six, six. I wasn't going to be as big as him. But, you know, he inspired me in so many different ways. And then when I was able to, you know, reach that level of, you know, one of the top guys in the NBA, I was able to build a relationship with Kobe. And it wasn't just no hoop relationship. It was an everyday, you know, lifestyle relationship in terms of, if I was going through something, I can hit him, and he was hitting me right back. Um, and, you know, he meant everything to me. When, when I was able to build that friendship with him, it was crazy checking my phone and seeing a text from Kobe. Right. Like, it didn't make no sense because, you know, I looked up to him for so long. So, you know, when I got signed with the Pelicans and they were giving me jersey options and 24 was there, it was no-brainer. Like, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to do my part into paying some type of homage to mm -hmm. my favorite player to ever play the game. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was able to, you know, pay a little bit of homage to them the little two weeks I was there and playing in the NBA. And, you know, that's the least I can do. And, you know, I've been wearing Kobe since 2015 to where, you know, I get my little customized Kobe's. Mm -hmm. and, you don't know, let, even, don't let Jack hear you that. You know, yeah, even that is like, you know. Unreal. It's unreal. See, I'm looking at this for you. <laughs> Look, even that's unreal to be able to, you know, and then when I was with Cleveland, they had my own player edition Kobe's mm -hmm. where they came out, and they had the little, it had a little chip on the tongue to where, you know, when my tooth came out in the playoffs. So, like, <laughs> and Kobe did that. You Look feel that. me? And then Kobe to do the little, he did, like, a deer basketball on me, and it was, like, those things that Kobe did, like, I'm going to cherish for the rest of my mm -hmm. life because that's, you know, that's a walking legend. And, you know, I can't thank him enough for not just changing my basketball career, but changing my way of life. Mm, and, yeah. you know, to be able to call those two guys, rest in peace, mentors and somebody right. that I could, Special. you know, when they were here, reach out at any time and they hit me right back. Like, you can't ask for, you yeah. can't ask for, you know, two people better than that. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Talk to us about the uh, book of Isaiah, your documentary on your journey through this tough process. So the book of Isaiah, we started in 2015. But overall, once my career's over, I want to do a movie because I got a production company called Slow Grind Media. We're slowly doing documentaries, sports documentaries, real life, you know, things, not just sports, but every walk of life, we're trying to tap into mm-hmm. those lanes. So at the end of my career, I'm going to do a movie on my my whole career from my last year of college to my last year in the NBA. And it's going to be called The Book of Isaiah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've done a couple documentaries, which one won, won a Webby, which is... Oh, congrats. Um, congrats. Book of Isaiah 2 won a Webby that year that I was in Cleveland and got traded to the, to the Lakers. That won a Webby. And I think... You know, I just want to tell my story because it relates to to so many people in the world. You know, me being, you know, 5'9", me being counted out, me being not given no no real chance to, to really succeed like everybody else be given. Um, I think that relates to the average, you know, the average person out there. And to just show them that, you know, I go through real shit that everybody goes through and the, to show them the ups and downs of a real career I think it will only be beneficial to, you know, the next generation of guys mm-hmm. trying to make it, not yeah, just in yeah. basketball, but, you know, in life. Because, you know, the things that I've been through have been, you know, it, it, it just haven't been sugar-coated. The and highs, it's also been little, documented. Yeah. Like, my shit, I, I seen the bottom, and I seen the top, mm-hmm. and then seen the bottom again. A lot of people's careers don't, don't get to see both. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, I want to, obviously, I've been documenting since 2010, but... I want people to really see it a day in and day out of what guys like, you know, ourselves go through. Mm-hmm. I think you said something interesting. You you started at low, the 60th pick, not sure if you're going to be drafted, to an all-star averaging nearly 30 points a game, playing an all-star game with Kobe, back down to the injury. You didn't know how bad it was to having to have that surgery. How did, How much did that just wear on you as a person? It wore on me a lot. You know, that goes back to them three years where my mental was just, I was trying to find it. Mm-hmm. You know, the up and down and the inconsistency of, you know, not knowing what's next. That's like going certain, from yeah. the 60th pick, not knowing if I'm going to make the team, mm-hmm. to proving that, you know, I'm an NBA player. To getting traded to Boston and, you know, being a sixth man at first to, to taking it to, I was fourth in MVP voting, second team all NBA. Then a year later, or that year getting traded to hitting rock bottom, getting injured, to signing one-year deals, to going from supposed to sign a max deal mm-hmm. to signing one-year vet minimum deals. Mm-hmm. Like, that shit hurt. That shit, that killed my spirit. But what helped me throughout those times is I had little them little boys at home, bro, mm-hmm. that... I couldn't be sad yeah. in front of them. I couldn't have a bad day in front they of them. They feel it. They feel you the know, energy. Like, <clears throat> they feel that. They see that. So that was my motivation to get it back and yeah. to hopefully get a chance to show that, you know, I'm 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 who I always been mm-hmm. and I'm going to be that and let me go out on my own. That's what I'm fighting for now. I'm I'm just fighting for a legit chance to show that I'm 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 myself and that I have Plenty of years to show I could still play at a high level. But to answer your question, mentally, man, I was cooked. I was cooked for a little bit. But, you know, I thank my small circle of friends, my small circle of family, and, you know, my mentors. I thank them for just sticking with me. I remember, you know, Damon Stoudemire texted me, like, what, don't break a nigga, what make a nigga, mm-hmm. you know? Thanks. And I take that to heart every day. You know, I won't allow this shit to break me. Mm-hmm. Ever, okay. and you know, if it went, if it did, it wouldn't. It <laughs> won't. It can't. It can't. Right. And I'm not gonna allow it mm-hmm. ever. ever. And like I said, I'm in a great space. Mentally, I'm in a great space that you know that's not gonna. It don't rock. It right, don't, don't, it don't rock nothing. like a boat no more. It's, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm even killed. Don't no. Don't get too high. Don't get too low. I want to see you make it back just so you could talk shit back to your kids. Yeah, Because I'm me to too. a point where oh. I can, my kids be talking big shit and I can't, I'm done uh, playing. I can't talk, you know what I mean? It's just, all right, no doubt. Hey, all right, little nigga, hey. shut up. <laughs> but you got a chance to get back too, out there, right? They, they, they be talking on my big head. shit, right? They oh, be on man. my head. Like, you ain't, you ain't what you used yeah. to. All right, One of my sons said something to me that I would have fought someone else for saying to me. Like, all right, that's how you feel? And you know, it's, 
There's no sugar coating no. when it's them. Like, like, they're, 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 yeah, they're, yeah, they're, daggers. They're, no they're, they're hitting you right here. And I'm like, I'm just smiling <laughs> off like, ooh, I, I wish no you I could play you one-on-one. Right. Don't right. feel to at all. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's funny. Going through everything you've been through, the ups and downs, the roller coasters, what advice would you give a younger player? The advice I would give a younger player, I think the same advice D. Rose gave me. Don't fight it. Mm. Just take the punches, keep grinding, and, you know, it can't storm forever. And, you know, I think the biggest thing that I try to tell those young guys coming in is, like, enjoy the moment, bro. That's one thing I, I wasn't able to enjoy when I was at the top, top. Because it was just, what's next? I got to do better. I was so paranoid. Enjoy those moments, bro, because they're going to pass. And you're going to look back and be like, dang. And that's what, you know, when I was injured, I was dealing with, like, dang, I was doing some crazy shit. Mm -hmm. I was breaking Larry Bird's records. I was breaking, you know, the greats' records. And I was so locked into those moments on some Kobe shit. I was so on some Mamba mm -hmm. mentality. Like, it's just not good enough. I got to keep going. Mm to where I think that's the best advice I can give those young dudes is stay in those moments, bro. Whether they're good or bad, enjoy those. Enjoy those moments and keep grinding and don't get satisfied. Because once you get comfortable out there, you know, they got another 19-year-old that's coming in nice and trying to eat. Mm -hmm. And you can't, you can't be complacent in this, in, you know, in this life, in this world. Because, right. you know, it's, it's what have you done for me lately. Mm -hmm. Thoughts on Mayweather Paul? Will you be in attendance? We will be. <laughs> um, I'm not gonna be in attendance. That's but your boy. It's gonna be, it's gonna be entertaining. I know, I know the setup with this. He's you gonna... talk to him? No, that's your boy. Yeah, yeah. I haven't spoke to him since this, but what's the what's the secret? He's just gonna entertain. He's an entertainer. Right. So you know, so he's not gonna try to punish him for all the little antics he didn't do. Oh, he's gonna try to punish him. Oh, yeah. not, no doubt. I know for him when you know when money talks, <laughs> it's, he's got but it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be entertainment, and then he's gonna make his case. Mm -hmm. Did, have you to talked like, to him since he snatched his hat? No, nah, I haven't. Oh, <laughs> he was mad. He was hot. So I know that's what I'm saying. Right. He's gonna he's gonna make it to he where he didn't wear the do rag the yeah, night yeah. before. He didn't wear the he didn't lay it down the night before. Uh, but he I made think bad. that's why he was really yeah, happy. That's, that's what I'm saying. saying. He was, that that was, was... Now, you know the champ. Come the on, champ man. The champ always... Clean. Clean, fresh. Gucci, all from head to toe. Two, that was the three, first time uh, we seen him. The 20 one, million on the wrist? <laughs> hey, the one day they caught him slipping. That was the, the first time we, we seen slipping. him slipping. That was the first mm -hmm. time we seen ever. He was ever. He wasn't. He wasn't. But he's yeah. gonna have to pay for that though. No, no, he's gonna have to pay for that. That's that's on the back of his head. Like, yeah. He know he gonna entertain the, the 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 people who's watching, but he gonna make a like mm -hmm. you know why I do this. I can't wait to see. Nah, it. it's gonna be fun. I'm what about since we talk about it? What about Ocho Cinco? What you think he gonna do? Come on, man. He's, a, he's <laughs> an entertainer too. He's an so entertainer he, he's too. Gonna, he's a he's an athlete. At the end of the day, he gonna be locked in. You know. I hope he's locked in. I hope he's locked in, too. I mean, since we're talking about boxing, obviously the homie is our <laughs> homie, too. What What were your thoughts when, when Nate fought Jake and then the outcome? The outcome was surprising. Can y'all laugh with it? Can you, can you laugh with him about it yet? Yeah, I think it's to a point you can laugh with him now. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, we've had our talks about it, and he's laughed it off. So, I mean, you know, obviously... Right. He got it, a million yeah, dollars for it. I mean, it. shit. This shit happens, bro. <laughs> right. you're not, at the end of the day, you're not a boxer. Hey, 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 I'd have hey, been down the TV on for free. <laughs> <laughs> so shit. You know what I mean? Come, Come on, on man. man. So, like, at the end of the day, obviously, the internet's undefeated. Right. You gonna get your little, you know, everybody gonna make, make yeah. jokes about it. It was on national TV. But that's my dude. Right, I'm yeah. gonna ride with that's him to the wheels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was in a fraternity that, you know, that's our guy. So, yeah, straight up. obviously, he got knocked. But, you know, yeah, you live and you learn, it's on to the net. A lot of people don't have the balls to get in there and scratch. Exactly. Yeah. At the yeah. end of the day, uh, most don't have the balls to go do that. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, he did it. He got knocked. We move on. Yeah, we You know, move at the end of the day, we, we men, and I'm not going to be at his house cracking jokes about it. Yeah. You know, yeah. if somebody crack a joke, if he want to crack one, we going to crack him. But <laughs> if not, you know, yeah. we, gonna, we just going to keep it moving. It <laughs> right. happened, and, you know. That's it. That's it. He's still yeah. Nate the Great and all that. Oh, no question. Yeah, I remember. Oh, Greatest after, athlete ever. Yeah, after, after, I, after that happened, I text him. I remember I'm like, you know, because, you know, everybody been in situations where they've been embarrassed. And yeah. I was like, bro, you still a superhero where we come mm, from. Straight Don't up. Don't forget that. Yeah. You feel me? So Word. 
I, I tried to say my two cents and just remind him, like, you're still yeah, the greatest great. where we yeah. come from. Nah, so. yeah. Hey, real talk, Nate's one of the great best athletes I've athletes ever seen in my life. we ever seen. Straight up and down. We ever seen. Straight so, up and down. you know, that don't define you. Right. Absolutely. But, it, I mean, it was funny. We're going to laugh for a little bit. Yeah, yeah no we're going to laugh, no but question. that's my dude. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, no quick question. hitters. First thing to come to mind, shoot it at us. Top five point guards of all time. Damn, that's tough. <laughs> Right off Start the rip. Start it off, yeah, off the cuff. Right off the rip. <laughs> I'm going to go with my namesake, Isaiah Thomas. Um, you got to pay homage to Magic Johnson, mm -hmm. first big point guard. Um, and then I'm going to go just my era. I'm going to go um, Steph Curry, Kyrie Irving, Chris Paul. Mm, solid. And no disrespect, this is just yeah, top five, yeah, yeah. off the top. Mm -hmm. Yeah, solid. Rapid fire. You plus four going to the blacktop. Who you taking with you? Blacktop, that's different. So yeah, we, we're anybody. taking... You, you don't know even what have to be NBA dudes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah, we might get shot. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you never know what pop yeah, up Yeah, you got to be built to be out there. So um, <laughs> for the love of it, I'm going to take Jamal Crawford. Of course. I'm ready for that. Yeah. Me, I was me, Jamal Crawford. On some real shit, I'm gonna take y'all too because I need I need some goons. You know what's going on. In case on. some shit go down, we need some, we some dudes that's gonna handle some stuff. We so gonna that's gonna, that's four right there. The black top. And now I'm gonna take Kyrie. Mm. Yeah, because he's he's gonna put on the show. Hey, we don't have to do nothing. Nah, nah. Fight. We security. Yeah, you, yeah. That's you, what I said, just fight. Yeah, yeah. yeah we security. So rebound out of hand, and rebound and kick We're gonna be embarrassing the dude. Shit get out of hand. Yeah. I can set some screens. Yeah, we gonna be betting. Yeah. We gonna be making all the side bets. Come on, man! Well, win. During timeouts, I'm gonna be smoking. <laughs> now, yeah, yeah, we ain't working harder. We working smarter, baby. I got, I got my protection. <laughs> nice. Top five artists, in your opinion? Top five artists: um, Jay Z, Drake, Tupac, Biggie, and Nipsey. Ooh, that's my list. Let me ask you a question. Yeah, that is your list. Mm -hmm. Who is the most um, famous rapper from Seattle? Sir Mix a lot. Sir Mix a lot. Sir Mix a lot. For okay. sure. Right, baby yeah. got back. How old were you when that shit was? You was a baby though, right? Yeah, yeah, I was a baby when he was rolling around in the Ferrari, the red Ferrari. Mm -hmm. He had some things out there too. Yeah, yeah. Nah, His he videos ran were live. Right? <laughs> he yeah. he ran it for sure. <laughs> the best five players Ooh. ever from Seattle, Washington. Um, Area. Best five. You go with. Ooh, that's tough. Nate Robinson. Jason Terry, Jamal Crawford, Brandon Roy. Damn. That one's tough. Um, I'm going to go with Martel Webster because he was the first to go out of high school. high school. And I always got to pay homage to him. Yeah, yeah. He's the first to go out of high school from our state. So mm -hmm. I'm going to go with him. I'm going to be the sixth man. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to deter off this question real quick. We'll get back to it. Tell people how good Brandon Roy was. Ah man, and I remember I remember a lot of interviews back back then. You will always say he's one of the toughest to guard. Kobe said he had no weaknesses. Um, Brandon Roy on one knee because mm -hmm. he only from had one jump. knee even from the in jump. college. One of the most special dudes. I always say. I mean, he would have been Hall of Fame if he mm -hmm. didn't. He would he would have went down as one of the best shooting guards to play. And for somebody like Kobe to say he had no weaknesses, Ron Artest, I think, said he was the hardest guy he he might have had to guard. Brandon Roy was the real deal. He was he was tough for all of us because the the size he was, he was too shifty. Too yeah. shifty. You know what I mean? He, and he, had, he was he like had, you. He, he loved to go left. He had a lot in his and, bag. But his strong hand was right. So, like, which way do you force him? Yeah, and his, and his step back was before time, before Come his on, time. Man. But he yeah. had a weird way of, with his size, being able to back anybody down. Yeah. It was weird. Like, he could back, he would back you down like Kobe could back you down. No matter how big and strong yeah. you are, he's still back you. He's still good. And I'm like, what? how nah, does this little motherfucker was, move with me? B-Roy was special. And like yeah. you said, I mean, from the jump, it had been on one knee. Mm -hmm. Most don't know that. Yeah. And then his other knee start messing up. But... Mm. B-Roy is special. Legend. Uh, five dinner guests, dead or alive? Five dinner guests. So guys that I want to be with me mm -hmm. at the dinner table. Mm -hmm. You plus five, dead or alive? Man, I want Tupac because I just want to mm -hmm. hear all the stories. I, I'm going to go with my guys, Nipsey and, and, and Cole. Um, I want Snoop there. So Nipsey, Cole, Snoop. 
Tupac. Um, I always wanted to meet Will Smith. I never got to meet, meet Will Smith, yeah, so yeah, I, was, I, was, I, I would like yeah. him there. That's what's up. This is a loaded question right here because you got a lot of motherfuckers that yeah. you know that we want, so. If you could have your choice to pick the guest that you want to see on All The Smoke, who would it be? Who would it be? Um, and if you know him, you need to help us. Yeah. Because I got a list already. Who of do Seattle you want people. to see? Yeah, I got, I got one off the rip. Jamal hasn't been on, right? Mm -mm. No, thank yeah. you. We got to get Jamal. I'm going to get yeah. Jamal. I'm, I'm going to yeah. call him right after this. Yeah, we need Jamal Showtime. Crawford. Because he, he has all the stories in the world. Too. Uh, no, no, like no. he story. has stories about us. That's Me what I'm saying. Sure. No, yeah. no doubt. Me for sure. His memory's insane. Oh, oh his my memory's God. unbelievable. He and he's going to feel tickling us after every joke. <laughs> he's going to. <laughs> <laughs> after every question. Hey, Jamal <laughs> says that's, that's big, bro. Jamal got to come on here. Because yeah, he Jamal. has stories from, he, what did he come in, 99, 2000? He got Jordan stories. Yes. He, got, he got a lot. So I would love... For him to and it's and it's authentic on here, so he gonna yeah, break it man, down okay, and good. not sugarcoat nothing. Good Jamal deal. Crawford got to be on here. But, he, but people don't know, Jay Crawford's one of the best basketball minds you could be around. Oh, yeah, sure. yeah. He, he kind of like you though, like he a student of the game. He could tell you stats yeah, and all. He could talk hoop all, all day. Oh my god, all day. bro! Put him on the spot real quick. You got your phone on you? Yeah. FaceTime. Oh, let me call. Fan. Showtime. Oh, you know he ain't got FaceTime. He got oh, a BlackBerry. Oh yeah, he's got the green phone. That's he right. Got he got the got BlackBerry. The, green. <laughs> so, yeah. the only person I know with the BlackBerry. <laughs> him. And it'd it'd probably D still a flip. Jay Craw. D Rose. They, but they must got to deal with BlackBerry or they something, They must got man. something. I'm about to call him right now and see if he has an answer. Oh, and you know he's going to answer. Oh, fam. Damn. You know them are my guys. Hey, Jay, Jay this is what he used to tell me for every game. One with the layup line. Oh, I smell it. What was that? Oh, the popcorn popping. <laughs> oh, I smell it. Oh, I smell it. It's popping. <laughs> oh, it's popping. You know, he, look, look. It's showtime. Hey, Jamal. It's showtime. Look, you on speakerphone. I got I got Stack and Matt here. We on we we on live, live. the show. You All gotta come smoke. on. We need you, bro. I, I gotta come on. You already know when I got to LA, I'm going there first. Showtime. <laughs> yeah. what's, hey, what's up, Showtime? Uh, hey, 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 Prime, Prime, what you doing? He called me Prime Time. <laughs> <laughs> That's my boy. Nah, we, <laughs> I, they wanted me to call you because we got to get, they, they, they need you on the we show. We need you, fam. They need you. I've been trying to get on there for two years. I said, I know they got a master plan. They just waiting to bring me on. Yeah, they just waiting to bring me on. <laughs> <laughs> we, hey, look, we were saying you got all the stories in the world. That's why you got to come on. Hey, I got stories I was saving just for their show. Ooh, <laughs> hey, wait. stop the show time. <laughs> hey, we can't wait, fam. See, he got it off the top of his head, too. That's funny. Nah, I was just calling oh, you, fam. Man. Okay, well, y'all have a good time. I'm coaching the kids, bro. I love it. Yeah, it's I, dope, I see, right? I see what I've been missing. It's I told you, man. Hey, and your little man's a killer, too. Yeah, he be balling. He's balling. He's getting better, too. Come on, man. It's your son. What you expect? Y'all, you know. Play just like him. All right. All right, fam. All right, boy. Yeah. Jamal. That's funny. That's dope. Yeah. Yeah. We got to get him. Hey, man, we appreciate your time, man. Thank you. Best of luck, man. We love your journey. We respect your journey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Appreciate it. Appreciate you, man. This is everything. Yeah, thank you. 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 I I'll appreciate you know, man, it. We love you. We appreciate you. It's all love. Always. Absolutely. Rocking with you. That's a wrap. All the smoke. Special guest Isaiah Thomas. You can catch this on Showtime Basketball YouTube or the iHeart platform Black Effects. See y'all next week. All of it. Are you ready for the show? Undefeated champion. Team of Bali a high quality operator. takes on future Hall of Famer. One of the most polished stars in all of boxing. Nonito Donaire. Ready, set, go. He remains Ready, at the set, top go. of his game. Ready, set, go. Undefeated versus legend. Obali versus Donaire for the Bantamweight World Title only on Showtime.